Never give up on your hopes and dreams. Persistence and determination alone are omnipotent. The slogan, Press On, has solved and always will solve the problems of the human race. Calvin Coolidge, 30th President of the United States Consider this. Admiral Robert Peary attempted to reach the North Pole seven times before he made it on try number eight. In its first 28 attempts to send rockets into space, NASA had 20 failures. Oscar Hammerstein had five flop shows that lasted less than a combined total of six weeks before Oklahoma, which ran for 269 weeks and grossed $7 million. Oprah Winfrey was fired from an early television reporting job as she was not deemed suitable for television. Tawny O'Dell's career as a writer is a testament to her perseverance. After 13 years, she had written six unpublished novels and collected 300 rejection slips. Finally, her first novel, Back Roads, was published after being chosen by Oprah Winfrey for the Oprah Book Club, and the newly anointed novel rose to number two on the New York Times bestsellers list, where it remained for eight weeks. Never, never, never give up. During the Vietnam War, Texas computer billionaire H. Ross Perot decided he would give a Christmas present to every American prisoner of war in Vietnam. According to David Frost, who tells the story, Perot had thousands of packages wrapped and prepared for shipping. He chartered a fleet of Boeing 707s to deliver them to Hanoi. But the war was at its height, and the Hanoi government said it would refuse to cooperate. No charity was possible, officials explained, while American bombers were devastating Vietnamese villages. Perot offered to hire an American construction firm to help rebuild what Americans had knocked down. The government still wouldn't cooperate. Christmas drew near, and the packages were unsent. Refusing to give up, Perot finally took off in his chartered fleet and flew to Moscow where his aides mailed the packages one at a time at the Moscow Central Post Office. They were delivered intact. Can you see now why this man became the great success that he did? He simply refused to ever quit. Hang in there. It's always too soon to quit. Norman Vincent Peale, Inspirational Author in 1992, screenwriter Greg Borton began writing the screenplay for Dallas Buyers Club. After drafting ten different scripts for the movie, he spent most of the mid-1990s trying to sell it, but no one was willing to finance the production of the film. According to an interview with Matthew McConaughey, who won an Academy Award for Best Actor in the starring role as AIDS patient Ron Woodruff, the film was turned down by potential backers 87 times before McConaughey eventually signed on 17 years later. In 1996, the script got sold with Dennis Hopper to direct and Woody Harrelson to star. But the company that bought the script went bankrupt. The next year, Borton teamed up with screenwriter Melissa Wallach to revamp the script and sell it to Universal, this time with Mark Forster to direct and Brad Pitt to star. But Forster and Pitt never made the film. Years later, after finally securing financing, director Gary Gillespie and actor Ryan Gosling agreed to do the film. But once more, the financing fell apart. As a result, Universal decided the script was not ready and shelved the film for another nine years. Eventually, due to a clause in their Writers Guild contract, Borton and Wallach managed to get back their rights to the script. And in 2009, nearly 20 years after the script was first conceived, Robbie Brenner, a producer who had been involved with the project almost from the beginning, convinced Matthew McConaughey to get involved. But even after McConaughey lost 47 pounds for the role, and with filming scheduled to begin in just 10 weeks, the new investors backed out. With actors and crew secured and ready to move forward, the production forged ahead and did the impossible. On a mere $5 million budget, they shot the entire film with one camera 
and 15-minute takes in just 25 days. Dallas Buyers Club was released in 2013 to universal acclaim by critics and audiences alike, and the tenacious commitment to see this film made eventually paid off in spades. Not only was it nominated for Best Picture at the Academy Awards, it earned nominations for Borton and Wallach for Best Original Screenplay at the 2014 Writers Guild of America Awards and at the Oscars and went on to garner numerous Best Actor Awards for McConaughey and Best Supporting Actor Awards for Jared Leto. By February 2014, the film had grossed more than $55 million worldwide. He wouldn't give up his dream. We usually overestimate what we think we can accomplish in one year, but we grossly underestimate what we can accomplish in a decade. Anthony Tony Robbins, motivational speaker and author of Awaken the Giant Within. Daryl Hammond started his career in acting in the 70s while attending the University of Florida. It was a rocky start because with his fumbling speech, the result of extreme child abuse by his mother, he was never cast in a role. He kept at it until eventually one theater professor took a chance on him and, because of Daryl's success in that and several subsequent roles, convinced him he should pursue a career in acting. After barely graduating with a 2.1 grade point average, Daryl followed his dream and moved to New York. But for the first several years, he waited tables and got so drunk at times that he could barely make it to auditions. Eventually, Daryl cut back on his drinking and started seriously studying acting at the prestigious Herbert Berghoff Studio which boasts alumni such as Robert De Niro, Matthew Broderick, Billy Crystal, Claire Danes, Whoopi Goldberg, Al Pacino, and Barbara Streisand. That led to some roles in plays off-Broadway and in regional theaters. When he was 26, Daryl tried his hand at stand-up comedy, fell in love with it, and set a goal to be a cast member on Saturday Night Live. But it didn't happen overnight, not even close. After not getting any traction in New York, he moved back to Florida and did voiceover work for the next few years. But he never gave up on his goal, and he committed to a program of self-improvement that helped him get through those years. He came up with the idea that if he could make one small improvement in his abilities once a week, that would be 52 improvements a year. He focused on this for five years and then moved back to New York City with the determination to become a successful stand-up comedian and attract the attention of the Saturday Night Live producers. Starting in your thirties is late for stand-up, and Daryl thought he might be too old to make it, but he decided to try anyway because he didn't want to give up on his dream. He used to put pictures of Harriet Tubman, Martin Luther King Jr., and Mahatma Gandhi on his wall for inspiration. The reason? They were people who probably didn't have any evidence they could accomplish what they wanted to accomplish, but they kept on going anyway. He continued to perform in the clubs around New York for the next seven years, during which time he had two failed auditions for Saturday Night Live. You'd think after seven years he would have given up. In fact, most people would have. But Daryl persisted. And finally, after seven long years, his persistence paid off. One night, during his act at Caroline's, he threw in a short impression of President Bill Clinton. It just so happened that night that a producer from Saturday Night Live was in the audience, and he was looking for someone for the show that could do a good Bill Clinton impression. As a result, Daryl was invited to audition for Lorne Michaels, the creator of Saturday Night Live. Daryl said he had been preparing for that moment for twelve years. He was ready, and he landed the role finally fulfilling his ultimate dream. Daryl went on to spend 14 years on the show, performing in more than 200 episodes, and became best known for his hilarious impressions of famous people such as Bill Clinton, Al Gore, Dick Cheney, and Donald Trump, as well as entertainers like Sean Connery and Jack Nicholson. Since he left the show in 2009, at 53 years of age, the oldest cast member in the history of the show, he has gone on to appear on Broadway and in numerous movies and television shows, including his own Comedy Central special. 
Daryl has had an extraordinary career because in the beginning he refused to give up. How to Deal with Obstacles For every failure, there's an alternative course of action. You just have to find it. When you come to a roadblock, take a detour. Mary Kay Ash Founder, Mary Kay Cosmetics Whenever you confront an obstacle or run into a roadblock, you need to stop and brainstorm three ways to get around, over, or through the block. For every obstacle, come up with three different strategies for handling the potential obstacle. There are any number of ways that will work, but you will find them only if you spend time looking for them. Always be solution-oriented in your thinking. Persevere until you find a way that works. Difficulties are opportunities to better things. They are stepping stones to greater experience. When one door closes, another always opens. As a natural law, it has to, to balance. Brian Adams, author of How to Succeed Principle 23 Practice the Rule of Five Success is the sum of small efforts, repeated day in and day out. Robert Collier, best-selling author and publisher of The Secret of the Ages. When Mark Victor Hansen and I published the first Chicken Soup for the Soul book, we were so eager and committed to making it a bestseller that we asked 15 best-selling authors, ranging from John Gray, Men Are From Mars, Women Are From Venus, to Ken Blanchard, The One Minute Manager, and Scott Peck, The Road Less Traveled, for their guidance and advice. We received a ton of valuable information about what to do and how to do it. Next, we visited with book publishing and marketing guru Dan Pointer, who gave us even more great information. Then we bought and read John Kramer's 1001 Ways to Market Your Book. After all of that, we were overwhelmed with possibilities. To tell the truth, we became a little crazy. We didn't know where to start. Plus, we both had our speaking and seminar business to run. Five Specific Things That Move You Toward Your Goal We sought the advice of Ron Scholastico, a wonderful teacher, who told us, If you would go every day to a very large tree and take five swings at it with a very sharp axe, eventually, no matter how large the tree, it would have to come down. How very simple and how very true. Out of that, we developed what we have called the Rule of Five. This simply means that every day, we do five specific things that will move our goal toward completion. With the goal of getting Chicken Soup for the Soul to the top of the New York Times bestseller list, it meant having five radio interviews or sending out five review copies to editors who might review the book or calling five network marketing companies and asking them to buy the book as a motivational tool for their salespeople, or giving a seminar to at least five people and selling the book in the back of the room. On some days, we would simply send out five free copies to people listed in the Celebrity Address Book, people such as Harrison Ford, Barbara Streisand, Paul McCartney, and Steven Spielberg. We made phone calls to people who could review the book. We wrote press releases. We called in to talk shows, some at 3 a.m. We gave away free copies at our talks. We sent them to ministers to use as a source of talks for their sermons. We gave free Chicken Soup for the Soul talks at churches. We did book signings at any bookstore that would have us. We asked businesses to make bulk purchases for their employees. We got the book into the PXs on military bases. We asked our fellow speakers to sell the book at their talks. We asked seminar companies to put it out in their catalogs. We bought a directory of catalogs and asked all the appropriate ones to carry the book. We visited gift shops and card shops and asked them to carry the book. We even got gas stations, bakeries, and restaurants to sell the book. It was a lot of effort. A minimum of five things a day, every day, day in and day out, for over two years. Look what a sustained effort can do. Was it worth it? Yes. 
the book eventually sold over 10 million copies in 43 languages. Did it happen overnight? No. We did not make a bestseller list until over a year after the book came out. A year! But it was the sustained effort of the Rule of Five for over two years that led to the success. One action at a time. One book at a time. One reader at a time. But slowly, over time, each reader told another reader. And eventually, like a slow-building chain letter, the word was spread and the book became a huge success, what Time magazine called the publishing phenomenon of the decade. It was less of a publishing phenomenon and more of a phenomenon of persistent effort, thousands of individual activities that all added up to one large success. In Chicken Soup for the Gardener's Soul, Geraldine Edwards describes the day her daughter Carolyn took her to Lake Arrowhead to see a wonder of nature, fields and fields of daffodils that extend for as far as the eye can see. From the top of the mountain, sloping down for many acres across folds and valleys, between the trees and bushes, following the terrain, there are rivers of daffodils in radiant bloom, a literal carpet of every hue of the color yellow, from the palest ivory to the deepest lemon to the most vivid salmon orange. There appear to be over a million daffodil bulbs planted in this beautiful natural scene. It takes your breath away. As they hiked into the center of this magical place, they eventually stumbled on a sign that read, Answers to the questions I know you are asking. The first answer was, One woman, two hands, two feet, and very little brain. The second was, One at a time. The third, Started in 1958. One woman had forever changed the world over a forty-year period, one bulb at a time. What might you accomplish if you were to do a little bit, five things, every day for the next forty years toward the accomplishment of your goal? If you wrote five pages a day, that would be seventy-three thousand pages of text, the equivalent of two hundred and forty-three books of three hundred pages each. If you saved five dollars a day, that would be $73,000, enough for four round-the-world trips. If you invested $5 a day with compound interest at only 6% a year, at the end of 40 years, you'd have amassed a small fortune of around $305,000. The Rule of Five. Pretty powerful little principle, wouldn't you agree? Principle 24. Exceed Expectations It's never crowded along the extra mile. Wayne Dyer, co-author of How to Get What You Really, 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 Really Want Are you someone who consistently goes the extra mile and routinely over-delivers on your promises? It's rare these days, but it's the hallmark of high achievers who know that exceeding expectations helps you stand above the crowd. Almost by force of habit, successful people simply do more. As a result, they experience not only greater financial rewards for their extra efforts, but also a personal transformation, becoming more self-confident, more self-reliant, and more influential with those around them. Go the Extra Mile Seattle-based Delano's Coffee Roasters roasts coffee beans, and distributes them to coffee retailers in almost all 50 U.S. states. Delano's mission statement is, help people, make friends, and have fun. The company has six core values that guide all of their activities. They are so committed to these values that the entire staff of 28 reads the list in unison at the end of every staff meeting. Number two on the list is, Provide an extra mile level of service, always giving the customer more than they expect. This means they treat every one of their customers like they treat a best friend, someone you'd go the extra mile for. In 1997, one of those friends, Marty Cox, who owned four It's a Grind coffee houses in Long Beach, California, was just an average size customer. But Marty had big plans for the future. 
Delano's founder and CEO, David Morris, wanted to help his friend fulfill his big dream. At the time, Delano's shipped their beans by UPS. But in 1997, UPS went on strike, creating a threat to Marty's livelihood. How to get Marty's beans, the lifeblood of his business, from Seattle to Long Beach? Delano's considered the option of using the post office, but the company had heard through the grapevine that the post offices and FedEx were way overworked because of the UPS strike, and they didn't want to risk the beans arriving late. So Morris rented a trailer and drove his 800-pound coffee order to Marty's location two weeks in a row. David made the 17-hour drive from Seattle to Long Beach, delivered Marty's one-week coffee supply, drove back, got more coffee, drove down there the next week, and delivered it again. That kind of commitment to go the extra mile, literally 2,320 miles round trip, turned Marty into a loyal long-term customer. And what has that meant to Delano's? In just six years, Marty's four stores grew into a 150-store franchise with retail operations in nine states. Marty is now Delano's biggest customer. Going the extra mile pays off. As a result of going the extra mile for all of their customers, Delano's has grown from a single 20-pound roaster in one 1,600-square-foot room roasting 200 pounds of coffee beans a month in 1992 to a 45,000-square-foot facility and 68 employees delivering well over 3.2 million pounds of coffee beans a year, with annual sales over $10 million and a growth rate that is on track to double every three years. And in 2011, Delano's was named Macro Roaster of the Year by Roast Magazine. Why go the extra mile? If you are willing to do more than you are paid to do, eventually you will be paid to do more than you do. Source unknown. So what's the payoff for you? When you give more than is expected, you are more likely to receive promotions, raises, bonuses, and extra benefits. You won't need to worry about job security. You'll always be the first hired and the last fired. Your business will make more money and attract lifelong loyal customers. You'll also find that you will feel more satisfied at the end of each day. But you have to start now for the rewards to begin appearing. Give something above and beyond what is expected. If you want to really excel at what you do, really become a howling success in business, school, or life, do more than is required, always giving something extra, something that is not expected. A business that goes the extra mile earns the respect, loyalty, and referrals of its customers. If you're focused on only your own needs, you may think that giving more than is expected is unfair. Why should you give extra effort without compensation or recognition? You have to trust that eventually it will get noticed and that you will receive the compensation and recognition that you deserve. Eventually, as the old saying goes, the cream always rises to the top. So will you and your company. You will earn an impeccable reputation, and that is one of your most valuable assets. Here are a few more examples of giving more than is expected. A client pays you for an oil painting, and you frame it for him at no extra charge. You sell someone a car, and you detail it and fill it up with gas before you deliver it to him. You sell someone a house, and when she moves in, she discovers a bottle of champagne and a gift certificate for $100 to a local gourmet restaurant. As an employee, you not only do all of your own work, but you also work on your day off when another employee calls in sick. You take on new responsibilities without demanding more pay. You offer to train a new employee. You anticipate problems before they occur and prevent them. You see something that needs to be done, and you act on it without waiting to be asked and you constantly look for what else you can do to make a contribution and be of service. Instead of focusing on how you can get more, you focus on how you can give more. 
what can you do to go the extra mile and give more value to your boss, more service to your clients and customers, and more value to your students? One way is to surprise people with more than they expect. I know a car dealer in Los Angeles who provides a free car wash for all of his customers every Saturday at his dealership. Nobody expects it, and everyone loves it. It gets him lots of referral business because everyone is always talking about how satisfied they are with his service. The Four Seasons Always Goes the Extra Mile The name Four Seasons is synonymous with knock-your-socks-off service. The hotel chain always goes the extra mile. If you ask for directions from hotel staffers, they never just tell you. They walk you there. They always treat everybody as if they are royalty. Dan Sullivan tells the story about the man who was taking his daughter to San Francisco for the weekend, but realized that he didn't know how to braid her hair the special way her mother did it. When he called the Four Seasons to see if there was a staff person who could help him out, he was told that there was a woman on staff who was already assigned that job. It was something that management had anticipated that guests would someday need and the hotel had it covered. Now that's going the extra mile. Another hotel chain that is noted for its outstanding service is the Ritz-Carlton. When I arrived at my room during my last stay at the Ritz-Carlton in Chicago, there was a hot thermos of chicken noodle soup waiting on the desk. It had a little sign on it that read, Chicken Soup for Jack Canfield's Body. It was accompanied by a wonderful card from the manager saying how much he and his staff enjoyed the chicken soup books. Nordstrom Goes the Extra Mile Nordstrom is a chain of retail stores that is known for going the extra mile. Nordstrom staff has always provided extraordinary service. Nordstrom salespeople have even been known to drop off merchandise to a customer on their way home from work. Nordstrom also has a policy that you can return anything at any time. Does the policy get abused? Sure it does. But as a result of this policy, Nordstrom has an extraordinary reputation for quality customer service. It is part of the company's carefully guarded brand image. As a result, Nordstrom is very profitable. Make a commitment to be world-class like the Four Seasons, Ritz-Carlton, and Nordstrom by going the extra mile and exceeding expectations, starting today. Part 2. Transform Yourself for Success The greatest revolution of our generation is the discovery that human beings, by changing the inner attitudes of their minds, can change the outer aspects of their lives. William James, Harvard Psychologist Principle 25. Drop out of the Ain't It Awful Club and surround yourself with successful people. You are the average of the five people you spend the most time with. Jim Rohn, self-made millionaire and successful author. When Tim Ferriss, the best-selling author of The Four-Hour Workweek, was 12 years old, an unidentified caller left the above Jim Rohn quote on his answering machine. It changed his life forever. For days, he couldn't get the idea out of his mind. At only twelve years of age, Tim recognized that the kids he was hanging out with were not the ones he wanted influencing his future. So he went to his mom and dad and asked them to send him to private school. Four years at St. Paul's School set him on a path that led to a junior year abroad in Japan studying judo and Zen meditation. Four years at Princeton University, where he became an all-American wrestler, a national kickboxing championship, and eventually starting his own company at the age of 23. Tim knew what every parent intuitively knows, that we become like the people we hang out with. Why else are parents always telling their kids that they don't want them hanging out with those kids? It's because we know that kids and adults become like the people they hang out with. That is why it is so important to spend time with the people you want to become like. If you want to be more successful, 
you have to start hanging out with more successful people. There are lots of places to find successful people. Join a professional association. Attend your professional conferences. Join the Chamber of Commerce. Join the Country Club. Join the Young President's Organization or the Young Entrepreneur's Organization. Volunteer for leadership positions. Join civic groups like Kiwanis, Optimists International, and Rotary International. Volunteer to serve with other leaders in your church, temple, or mosque. Attend lectures, symposia, courses, seminars, clinics, camps, and retreats taught by those who have already achieved what you want to achieve. Fly first class or business class whenever you can. You become like the people you spend the most time with. Pay any price to stay in the presence of extraordinary people. Mike Murdoch, author of The Leadership Secrets of Jesus. John Asaroff is a successful entrepreneur who has seemingly done it all, including traveling the world for a year in his twenties, owning and operating a franchising company whose annual real estate revenues topped $3 billion, and helping to build Internet virtual tour pioneer Bamboo.com, now IPix, from a team of six people to a team of 1,500 in just over a year netting millions in monthly sales, and completing a successful initial public offering on the NASDAQ after just nine months. John was a street kid who had been entangled in the world of drugs and gangs. When he landed a job working in the gym at the Jewish community center across the street from his apartment in Montreal, his life was changed by the powerful principle that you become like the people you spend the most time with. In addition to earning $1.65 an hour, he received access to the Men's Health Club. John recounts that he got his early education in business in the Men's Sauna. Every night after work, from 9.15 to 10 p.m., you'd find him in the steamy hot room listening to successful businessmen tell their tales of success and failure. Many of those successful men were immigrants who had come to Canada to stake their claim and John was fascinated as much by their setbacks as by their successes. The stories of what went wrong with their businesses, families, and health gave him inspiration, because his own family was experiencing tremendous challenges and difficulties. And John learned that it was normal to have challenges, that other families also went through similar crises and still made it to the top. These successful people taught John to never give up on his dreams. No matter what the failure, they told him, try another way. Try going up, over, around, or through, but never give up. There's always a way. John also learned from these successful men that it makes no difference where you are born, what race or color you are, how old you are, or whether you come from a rich family or a poor family. Many of the men in that sauna spoke broken English. Some were single and some were divorced. Some were happily married, and some were not. Some were healthy, and others were in terrible shape. Some had college degrees, and some didn't. Some hadn't even been to high school. For the first time, John realized that success is not reserved just for those born into well-to-do families without challenges, and to whom every advantage has been given. He realized that no matter what the conditions of your life, you could build a life of success. He was in the presence of men from all walks of life who had done it, and freely shared their wisdom and experience with him. Every night, John attended his own private business school, in a sauna, in a Jewish community center. You, too, need to be surrounded with those who have done it. You need to be surrounded with people who have a positive attitude, a solution-oriented approach to life, people who know that they can accomplish whatever they set out to do. Confidence is contagious. So is lack of confidence. Vince Lombardi, head coach of the Green Bay Packers, who led them to six division titles, five NFL championships, and two Super Bowls. Drop out of the Ain't It Awful Club. There are two types of people, anchors and motors. You want to lose the anchors, 
and get with the motors, because the motors are going somewhere and they're having more fun. The anchors will just drag you down. Wyland, world-renowned marine artist. When I was a first-year history teacher in a Chicago high school, I quickly stopped going into the teacher's lounge, which I soon dubbed the Ain't It Awful Club. Worse than the haze of cigarette smoke that constantly hung over the room was the cloud of emotional negativity. Can you believe what they want us to do now? I got that Simmons kid again this year in math. He's a holy terror. There is no way you can teach these kids. They are totally out of control. It was a constant stream of negative judgments, criticisms, blaming, and complaining. Not too long after, I discovered a group of dedicated teachers that hung out in the library and ate together at two tables in the teacher's lunchroom. They were positive and believed they could overcome and handle anything that was thrown at them. I implemented every new idea they shared with me as well as a few more that I picked up from my weekend classes at the University of Chicago. As a result, I was selected by the students as Teacher of the Year in only my first year of teaching. Be selective. I just do not hang around anybody that I don't want to be with, period. For me, that's been a blessing, and I can stay positive. I hang around people who are happy, who are growing, who want to learn who don't mind saying sorry or thank you, and are having a fun time. John Asaroff, author, The Street Kid's Guide to Having It All I'd like you to do a valuable exercise that my mentor W. Clement Stone did with me. Make a list of everyone you spend time with on a regular basis, your family members, co-workers, neighbors, friends, people in your civic organization, fellow members of your religious group, and so on. When you've completed your list, go back and put a minus sign next to those people who are negative and toxic, and a plus sign next to those who are positive and nurturing. As you make a decision about each person, you might find that a pattern will begin to form. Perhaps your entire workplace is filled with toxic personalities, or perhaps it's your friends who naysay everything you do. Or maybe it's your family members who constantly put you down and undermine your self-esteem and self-confidence. I want you to do the same thing that Mr. Stone told me to do. Stop spending time with those people with a minus sign next to their name. If that is impossible, and remember, nothing is impossible, it is always a choice, then severely decrease the amount of time you spend with them. You have to free yourself from the negative influence of others. Are there people in your life who are always complaining and blaming others for their circumstances? Are there people who are always judging others, spreading negative gossip, and talking about how bad it is? Stop spending time with them as well. Are there people in your life who, simply by calling you on the telephone, can bring tension, stress, and disorder to your day? Are there dream stealers who tell you that your dreams are impossible and try to dissuade you from believing in and pursuing your goals. Do you have friends who constantly attempt to bring you back down to their level? If so, then it is time for some new friends. Avoid toxic people. Surround yourself with only people who are going to lift you higher. Oprah Winfrey, billionaire talk show host, actor, founder of The Own Network. Until you reach the point in your self-development where you no longer allow people to affect you with their negativity, you need to avoid toxic people at all costs. You're better off spending time alone than spending time with people who will hold you back with their victim mentality and their mediocre standards. Make a conscious effort to surround yourself with positive, nourishing, and uplifting people, people who believe in you encourage you to go after your dreams, and applaud your victories. Surround yourself with possibility thinkers, idealists, and visionaries. Surround yourself with successful people. One of the clients who hired me to teach these success principles to their salespeople is one of the leading manufacturers of optical lenses. As I mingled with the salespeople prior to the event, I asked each person I met 
if he or she knew who the top five salespeople in the company were. Most answered yes, and quickly rattled off their names. That night I asked my audience of 300 people to raise their hands if they knew the names of the top five salespeople. Almost everyone raised a hand. I then asked them to raise their hands again if they had ever approached any of those five people and asked them to share their secrets of success. Not one hand went up. Think about it. Everyone knew who the most effective people in the company were, but because of an unfounded fear of rejection, nobody had ever asked these sales leaders to share their secrets. If you are going to be successful, you have to start hanging out with the successful people. You need to ask them to share their success strategies with you. Then try them on and see if they fit for you. Experiment with doing what they do, reading what they read, thinking the way they think, and so on. If these new ways of thinking and behaving work for you, adopt them. If not, drop them and keep looking and experimenting. Principle 26. Acknowledge your positive past. I look back on my life like a good day's work. It is done, and I am satisfied with it. Grandma Moses, American folk artist who lived 101 years. Most people in our culture remember their failures more than their successes. One reason for this is the leave them alone pounce approach to parenting, teaching, and management that is so prevalent in our culture. When you were a young child, your parents left you alone when you were playing and being cooperative, and then pounced on you when you made too much noise, were a nuisance, or got into trouble. You probably received a perfunctory good job when you got A's, but got a huge lecture when you got C's and D's, or, God forbid, an F. In school, most of your teachers marked the answers you got wrong with an X, rather than marking the ones you got right with a check mark or a star. In sports, you got yelled at when you dropped the football or the baseball. There was almost always more emotional intensity around your errors, mistakes, and failures than there was around your successes. Because the brain more easily remembers events that were accompanied by strong emotions, most people underestimate and underappreciate the number of successes they've had compared to the number of failures they've had. One of the ways to counteract this phenomenon is to consciously focus on and celebrate your successes. One of the exercises I do in my corporate seminar is to have the participants each share a success they have had in the past week. It is always amazing to see how difficult this is for so many people. Many people don't think they have had any successes. They can easily tell you ten ways they messed up in the last seven days, but have a harder time telling you ten victories they had. The sad truth is that we all have many more victories than failures. It's just that we set the bar too high for what we call a success. A participant in the Goals, Gaining Opportunities and Life Skills program I developed to help get people off welfare in California actually asserted that he didn't have any successes. When I inquired about his accent, he told us that he had left Iran when the Shah was toppled in 1979. He had moved his whole family to Germany, where he had learned German and become a car mechanic. More recently, he had immigrated his whole family to the United States, had learned English, and was now in a program learning to be a welder. But he didn't think he had any successes. When the group asked him what he thought a success was, he replied that it was owning a home in Beverly Hills and driving a Cadillac. In his mind, anything less than that was not an achievement. Slowly, with a little coaching, he began to see that he had many success experiences every single week. Simple things such as getting to work on time, getting into the goals program, learning to speak English, providing for his family, and buying his daughter her first bicycle were all successes. The Poker Chip Theory of Self-Esteem and Success So why am I making such a big deal about acknowledging your past successes? The reason it is so important is because of its impact on your self-esteem. Imagine for a moment that your self-esteem is like a stack of poker chips. 
Then imagine that you and I are playing a game of poker, and you have ten chips, and I have two hundred chips. Who do you think is going to play more conservatively in this game of poker? Yes, you are. If you lose two bets of five chips, you're out of the game. I can lose five chips forty times before I'm out of the game. So I am going to take more risks, because I can afford to take the losses. Your level of self-esteem works the same way. The more self-esteem you have, the more risks you are willing to take. Research has shown over and over again that the more you acknowledge your past successes, the more confident you become in taking on and successfully accomplishing new ones. You know that even if you fail, it won't destroy you, because your self-esteem is high. And the more you risk, the more you win in life. The more shots you take, the more chances you have of scoring. Knowing that you have had successes in the past will give you the self-confidence that you can have more successes in the future. So let's look at some simple but powerful ways to build and maintain high levels of self-confidence and self-esteem. Begin with nine major successes. Here is a simple way to begin an inventory of your major successes. Consider having your spouse or family do this exercise, too. Start by dividing your life into three equal time periods. For example, if you are 45 years old, your three time periods would be from birth to age 15, 16 to 30 years, and 31 to 45 years. Then list three successes you've had for each time period. To help get you started, I've listed my own below. First third, birth to age 23. One, elected patrol leader in the Boy Scouts. Two, caught winning touchdown pass to win city championship game. Three, graduated from Harvard University. Second third, age 24 to 47. One, earned my master's degree in education from the University of Massachusetts. Two, published my first book. Three, founded the New England Center for Personal and Organizational Development. Final third, age 47 to 70. One, founded the Canfield Training Group. Two, Chicken Soup for the Soul hit number one on the New York Times bestseller list. Three, achieved goal of having spoken professionally in all 50 states. Can you list 100 successes? To really convince yourself that you're a successful person who can continue to achieve great things, the next step of this exercise is to make a list of 100 successes you've had in your life. My experience is that most people do fine coming up with the first 30 or so. Then it becomes a little more difficult. To come up with 100, you're going to have to list things like learning to ride a bicycle, singing a solo at church, getting your first summer job, the first time you got a hit in Little League, making the cheerleading squad, getting your driver's license, writing an article for your school newspaper, getting an A in Mr. Simon's history class, surviving basic training, learning to surf, winning a ribbon at the county fair, modifying your first car, getting married, having your first child, and leading a fundraising campaign for your child's school. These are all things you probably take for granted now but they all need to be acknowledged as successes you've had in life. If you are young, you may even need to resort to writing down things like past first grade, past second grade, past third grade, but that's okay. The goal is simply to get to 100. Create a victory log. Another powerful way to keep adding to the stack of poker chips is to keep a written record of your daily successes. It can be as simple as a running list in a spiral-bound notebook, or a document on your computer, or it can be as elaborate as a leather-bound journal. By recalling and writing down your successes each day, you log them into your long-term memory, which enhances your self-esteem and builds your self-confidence. And later, if you need a boost of self-confidence, you can reread what you have written down. Peter Thigpen a former vice president at Levi Strauss and Company kept such a victory log on his desk, and every time he had a victory or a win, he wrote it down. When he was about to do something scary, such as negotiate for a multi-million dollar bank loan or make a speech to the board of directors, 
he would read his victory log to build up his self-confidence. His list included entries such as, I opened up China as a market. I got my teenage son to clean up his room. And I got the board to approve the new expansion plan. When most people are about to embark on some frightening task, they have a tendency to focus on all the times they tried before and didn't succeed, which undermines their self-confidence and feeds their fear that they will fail again. Keeping and referring to your victory log keeps you focused on your successes instead. Start your own victory log as soon as possible. If you want, you can also embellish it like a scrapbook with photos, certificates, memos, and other reminders of your success. If many of your victories are featured on the Internet, for example, if you're an athlete, artist, author, or business person who appears in online news, photo galleries, interviews, or book reviews, you can make a digital scrapbook using the online tool called Pinterest. Pinterest lets you collect links or bookmarks to photos, quotes, and written content featured anywhere on the Internet. Simply start an account at www.pinterest.com and begin pinning things you find online that talk about, portray, or visually capture your victories, such as news articles, blog posts, web pages, or photographs. Collect and organize these pins on your Pinterest board, which is created and controlled by you. If you like, you can share your victory log with friends and family, or with other Pinterest users who want to follow your board. And if you own a business and want to use some of your victories for promotional or public relations purposes, simply share your entire Pinterest board or share a subset of accomplishments by collecting them into themes or topics. Display Your Success Symbols Researchers have discovered that what you see in your environment has a psychological impact on your moods, your attitudes, and your behavior. Your environment has a great deal of influence over you. But here's an even more important fact. You have almost total control over your immediate environment. You get to choose what pictures are hung on your bedroom or office wall, what memorabilia gets taped to your refrigerator or locker door, and what mementos you place on your desk or in your cubicle at work. A valuable technique that will help build your self-esteem and motivate you to greater future success is the practice of surrounding yourself with awards, pictures, and other objects that remind you of your successes. These might include medals from your armed services days, a picture of you scoring the winning touchdown, a picture of you standing on the Great Wall of China, your wedding picture, a trophy, a framed copy of the poem you had published in the local newspaper, a letter of thanks, your college diploma, or your Eagle Scout badge or Girl Scout gold award. Make a special place, a special shelf, the top of your dresser, the refrigerator door, a victory wall in the hallway you pass through every day, and fill it with your success symbols. Clean out that special drawer, those boxes in the closet, your files, then frame, laminate, polish, and display those symbols of your success so that you will see them every day. This will have a powerful effect on your subconscious mind. It will subtly program you to see yourself as a winner, someone who has consistent successes in life. It will also convey this message to others. It will instill confidence in you and in others for you. This is also a great thing to do for your children. Proudly display their success symbols as well. Papers, ribbons, artwork, photographs of them in their baseball uniform or playing the violin, photographs of them enjoying themselves, trophies, medals, and other awards. If you have children living at home, frame their best artwork and hang it on the walls of the kitchen, their rooms, and the hallways in the house. When they see these framed and on the wall, it can be a major boost to their self-esteem. The Mirror Exercise You are a living magnet. What you attract into your life is in harmony with your dominant thoughts. Brian Tracy, Leading Authority on the Development of Human Potential and Personal Effectiveness Just as you acknowledge your big successes, you need to acknowledge your small daily successes, too. The mirror exercise is based on the principle that we all need acknowledgement. 
but the most important acknowledgement is the acknowledgement you give yourself. The mirror exercise gives your inner child, which resides in your subconscious mind, the positive strokes it needs to pursue further achievements. It helps change any negative beliefs you have toward praise and accomplishment and puts you in an achieving frame of mind. Do this exercise for a minimum of three months. After that, you can decide whether you want to continue. I know some very successful people who have been doing this every night for years. Just before going to bed, stand in front of a mirror and appreciate yourself for all that you have accomplished during the day. Start with a few seconds of looking directly into the eyes of the person in the mirror, your mirror image looking back at you. Then address yourself by name and begin appreciating yourself out loud for the following things. Any achievements, business, financial, educational, personal, physical, spiritual, or emotional. Any personal disciplines you kept, dietary, exercise, reading, meditation, prayer. Any temptations that you did not give in to, eating dessert, lying, watching too much TV, staying up too late, drinking too much. Maintain eye contact with yourself throughout the exercise. When you're finished appreciating yourself, complete the exercise by continuing to look deep into your own eyes and saying, I love you. Then stand there for another few seconds to really feel the impact of the experience, as if you were the one in the mirror who had just listened to all of this appreciation. The important thing during this last part is to not just turn away from the mirror feeling embarrassed or thinking of yourself or the exercise as stupid or silly. Here is an example of what your exercise might sound like. Jack, I want to appreciate you for the following things today. First, I want to appreciate you for going to bed on time last night without staying up too late watching TV, so that you got up bright and early this morning and had a really good conversation with Inga. And then you meditated for 20 minutes and worked out for 30 minutes before you took a shower. You ate a healthy, low-fat, low-carbohydrate breakfast. You got to work on time and led a very good staff meeting with your support team. You did a great job of helping everyone listen to everybody's feelings and ideas. And you were great at drawing out the quiet ones. Let's see. Oh, and then you ate a really healthy lunch, soup and salad. And you didn't have the dessert that was offered. And you drank the ten glasses of water that you committed to drinking every day. And then, let's see, you finished editing the new Train the Trainer manual, and you got a really good start on scheduling the summer management training program. And then you filled in your daily success focus journal before you left work. Oh, and you appreciated Veronica for solving the problems with the travel schedule. It was great to see how she just lit up. And when you got home, you called Oren and talked with your grandson on Skype. That was really special. And now you're going to bed at a good time again, and not staying up all night surfing the Internet. You were great today. And one more thing. Jack, I love you. It is not unusual to have a number of reactions the first few times you do this. You might feel silly, embarrassed, like crying, or actually begin crying, or just generally uncomfortable. Occasionally, people have even reported breaking out in hives, feeling hot and sweaty, or feeling a little lightheaded. These are natural and normal reactions, as this is a very unfamiliar thing to be doing. We are not trained to acknowledge ourselves. In fact, we are mostly trained to do the opposite. Don't toot your own horn. Don't get a swelled head. Don't get a stuffed shirt. Pride is a sin. When you begin to act more positive and nurturing toward yourself, it is natural to have physical and emotional reactions as you release the old negative parental wounds, unrealistic expectations, and self-judgments. If you experience any of these things, and not all people do, don't let these things stop you. They are only temporary and will pass after a few days of doing the exercise. When I first began to do this exercise, after just 40 days, I noticed that all my negative internal self-talk had totally vanished, crowded out by the daily positive focus of the mirror exercise. 
I used to berate myself for things like misplacing my car keys or my glasses. That critical voice just simply disappeared. The same kind of thing can happen for you, but only if you take the time to actually do the exercise. One note to remember. If you find yourself lying in bed realizing you haven't done the mirror exercise yet, get out of bed and do it. Looking at yourself in the mirror is a critical part of the exercise. And one last bit of advice. Be sure to let your spouse, children, roommate, or parents know in advance that you will be doing this exercise each evening for the next three months or more. You don't want them to walk in on you and think you've lost your mind. In fact, you are powerfully retraining your mind to focus on the positive while building up your stack of poker chips.